Tammy Lissa Parrish, and I'm going to be talking about 18th century children's clothing and clothing from the time period altogether. Uh, a lot of it was imported from England. It was very affordable to get the fabric from England, be it wool, silk, linen, cotton. Uh, cotton was grown here along the James River and started in 1630 and then it was mass produced in Europe in like 1730. We started mass producing the cotton. But it was very time and labor intensive here in the United States, here in the colonies. Mostly in the United States, in the colonies. So some of the basic fabrics, and I can pass them around here. There were the animal fabrics and the plant fabrics. Linen and the cotton. There were blends such as Lindsay Woolsey, which was the linen and the wool used whenever they would spin that. I'd like to see the I saw that part. Okay. For the um, infants, their basic clothing started out, and this is a clout. This would have been their diaper or their napkin. And it's double folded and then just tied around the waist. That's the clout, and then over top of that, you would have had a pilch, kind of like what we would have thought of in the um, 20th century of a pair of rubber pants. And of course, they would have needed a shirt. In colder weather, because there's no furnace in the houses back then, just the fireplace as the heat source, we would have layered even more, an undercap and an overcap. Then there would have been a robe. And then one more layer, and this would have been a, a type of flannel. Not the same flannels we have today, but a type of flannel back then that would have been over that. And then lots of times they swaddled the children. They had a long band of fabric that they would wrap them around. That was used more prevalent. It was more prevalent in Europe. It was used some in the colonies, but more prevalent in, in Europe. What would you say the difference is between the flannel that they used then and the flannel now in terms of how it was made or the what? what? I think in that book it does have the, the type of flannel. Um, I don't know if this is more like a cotton flannel, right? And that would have been more like a, a wool Whoa. flannel back then. Yeah. And then this is a, an example of a pair of leather stays. They put started the boys and girls both in stays because they felt if they kept them straight, they grew straight. But there are stories that are told that they laced them too tightly and they fractured the infant's ribs. Now, when they started to walk... So, from what age would they have? Infants. Infants and children. Uh, even, and that picture, that he made from a picture he got in a Williamsburg book, but just because they wanted correct posture instead of them slouching. Wow. So, keep them straight. This and that, that would be in, in what level of income? That would be All lower levels. class, middle class, upper class? All levels. Huh. Uh, you don't think of how simple that we dress today as opposed to back then. And the clothing then too, they, you'd be walking down the street and they could tell what class you were by how you were dressed. This is called a pudding cap and they would put this on the infant's head or the children's heads, the toddler's heads when they started to walk so that whenever they fell down it protected their heads. It was stuffed with horse hair with wool, with old rags, just something to give some padding. Now, as they got older then, boys and girls both wore petticoats or skirts until the boys were potty trained. So this is an example of how you would have started to dress. Actually, you wouldn't have started to dress with this. You would have this on when you went to bed. This is our shift. This is the young girl's shift. This is also our underwear. This is what's closest to our skin. And of course, she'd have her stockings and her shoes on. Like I have my buckle shoes. 
And then the next layer, for that, she would need to tie her pocket on around her waist. Then her petticoat. So if she wanted to have something in the pocket and access it, she'd have to go through several layers. No. She, there are slits in the side of the petticoat. Once I get it on here. Openings on either side. And I'm just, she's kind of skinny, so I'm just going to, this ribbon's longer for her. But that will be tied around her waist. And then because the opening here on the side, she can reach down into her pocket. And you'll notice a little difference in her petticoat than mine. Hers has grow pleats in it. Mine doesn't because I'm not going to be getting any taller, but the young misses, we knew that they were going to get taller, so they were little um, pleats that we made in the fabric once we made it because we who knew when we were going to get fabric again, so we needed to have something that we could let out so she could get more wear out of it. Then with that, so, we have two options. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so the, how do you let them out? How do you... They're just basted in place, so you just cut the thread and pull the thread out. Oh, so then you get down. then you get another inch or two. You get an extra two inches for each plate. For each plate. plate. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So then because she's middle class, she would have what's called as a, a short gown, and that would have been pinned into place. And then perhaps she would have had another, had an apron over top of that to help protect, keep her petticoat clean and help keep her short gown closed. Then of course she would have had something on her head to keep her hair back out of her eyes and to keep her hair clean. And I have a modesty piece. There's a modesty piece around here. We protected our skin from the sun. And from peering eyes. And from peering eyes, exactly. So let's say she is a little higher in society. There's her modesty piece. We put her gown on. And it closes with hooks and eyes on the side. It could have been pins. Women gowns had very few buttons in them. The, be the buttons were reserved for the men and the boys. But then that would have put hooked the knife like that. Added benefit to this is you see two buttons back here. Those buttons would have been used to make this into a polonaise gown. There are ribbons under here. So, so, so polonaise, polonaise is a style that's it's it's uh, doesn't it's not necessarily for some practical value, but it has just a fashion. Fashion, yeah, polonaise, and that, that we could poof it up in the back. That's the polonaise style of the gown. Yes. But then that exposes her petticoat. Her under petticoat. She her, um, may have um, another fancier petticoat over top of that one. That she. If she wanted to show off, if she had something with some nice little lace or something on the bottom of it to make it a little fancier. Oh, so she wouldn't mind showing off? No. Back in that time, did they have panties that they used? In the 18th century, no. They would have come more with the Civil War with the pantaloons. Okay. Yeah. So that would have been your typical girls' clothing. Always then. Like I said, they were in 
skirts or petticoats, gowns, until they were potty trained. Then when they were potty trained, they went to their, I'm sorry, I'll bring her up here. They would have went to their first pair of breeches. But they also started out with their basic garment, their undergarment, they're also their, their nightgown. They slept in this, like Paul's checkered shirt. This checkered shirt comes down about almost to his knee. So for the boys, it would have been their shirt, their shoes, their stockings. This is a pair of ball front breeches. And this is what they would have went into whenever they became potty trained. And you can see because of so many buttons to get it, getting it off, if they weren't potty trained, how many times do you think they were going to have accidents? Yeah. If they were in a gown or petticoat, you know, as long as they weren't sitting down, no big deal. And that just ties in the back to give them room like that. And then they would have needed to have a, a waistcoat or a waistcoat on. They were dressed, and they were dressed up and thought of as little adults until probably the, eight, the last part of the se like 1780s, then they realized that they weren't little adults and they were allowed to be more like children and dressed them a little differently. But then they would have had that on. Um, a head covering. This is a workman's cap. Paul doesn't have his own, but a workman's cap to keep their hair clean, keep it out of their eyes, similar to why you wear a, a cap today. Then if he's going out, as long as he's in the house, but if he was going out into public, they would all also have another coat that they would put over top of that. It could be similar to this, but it would have sleeves on it. Um, so as far as the pants for kit for young boys, uh, would it be most often, most likely that they would have the, the side side buttons like that? Or, or single buttons down the center, most yes. likely on the sides? There are two different styles. This is fall front. There's a fly front. Fly front. Fly front. Um, it still has the waistband that goes around there, but there are, it's a fly front here. Paul had his on yesterday or else he doesn't have one today, right? Fly front came first in the time period and then the fall front came after that. Uh, as the period progressed, for the pre-revolutionary -revo war, the waistcoat's a little shorter. For French and Indian, it's longer. And then as we get into the 19th century, it's even shorter. It's more to waist for that. Tricorn hat. The young boys also would have had a hat like this, tricorn in it as it's folded up in three points, or a cocked hat, because it's cocked up on the side. And the reason why they wore these was because of carrying the rifle. So because if it was down, it would be too easy carrying the rifle to bump their hats, so it was turned up. And what would the hats typically be made out of? Wool, like a wool felt. Mm -hmm. The, the boys didn't have the, the lace. Did they just make new pants as they grew up? You mean any growth leaves? Yeah. Lots of times these are longer in that they're, they may have made them longer so that they closed below their knee, so at least as they got a little taller, but it was normally worn like two inches below the knee cap. Okay. There is another style that I make. That's the drawstring, uh -huh. which is more like a costume type pants. Mm -hmm. In that they're drawstring at the waist and drawstring down there. Now there are some pictures of um, breeches that did have the drawstring. Mm -hmm. Golf front or fly front, but drawstring on the side there, um, buckle or button. Would the classes differ as to whether having buttons or buckles? Differ more in the fabrics. Uh -huh. The richer fabrics would have been for the higher class. 
wooden buttons for a lower class, uh, pewter buttons would have been more higher class, okay. or they even have some that are stamped. So, and you can tell it's not, okay, well that's flat uh, pewter buttons as opposed to one that has a design. Mm -hmm. No, Alyssa, for young boys, would the knicker style or full-length pants style be more common? You could have had trousers, too. That would have been possible. And if they had the trousers, lots of times, if they had the fabric available, put a, a bigger hem in that, so as they grew taller, then you could let the hem out. Yeah. And trousers, lots of times, were used if they were out in the field to protect their legs. Um, the, some of the soldiers wore trousers, some of the sailors something more to protect the legs, yes. But uh, for for young boys, it could be either. I mean, it, I mean. Could be either, yeah. yes. Whatever you had, depending upon your station in life, whatever you had available. Yeah. You know, if you, if it's, okay, so that's out of fashion now, the trousers, well then I'm rich enough, I can get the, buy the fabric or buy it already made from England. Uh, weaver wise, they did have weavers. Spin and wool, you'd have some of your linen or some of your wool yarn. They had weavers that would come around to the different communities and set up their loom and then they would weave your fabric. But it was just so affordable that you could get it from the mother country. So when did when did the uh, local uh, fabric industry really take off after the after the, the uh, whenever England wanted us to start paying more and more for things and we decided we wanted to be separate from the mother country we wanted to be self-sufficient so yeah. now that's when we started making our so before or after the Revolutionary War after the Revolutionary War after yeah but that's whenever we started making more in the colonies yes after the Revolutionary War yes yeah because we couldn't get it back. It's like, oh, well. Yeah. Or you can even say maybe a little bit during it because there were all these tariffs and embargo taxes for things coming in. It's like, well, I'm not paying that. I'll, I'll do it out first. Yeah. Or else I'll get cheaper fabric. Like this book has. See how the work rate all the way back here was Okay, here's your question, your answer to your flannel. It was a plain woolen weave. So mostly it was wool flannel, not wool. cotton flannel. Wool flannel. Yeah. So were most of now, uh, when was when was cotton grown in abundant quality in the colonies? Was that before or after the Revolutionary War? I mean, did we were say before the Revolutionary War, were we growing cotton and sending it to England and they were processing it and they sending were processing back clothing? It back because they had machines that could process yes. that in England, which we didn't have here. So we just send the raw cotton we in there. And it was very it was okay to grow this stuff, but you think of whether you have the wool, whether you have the cotton. Okay, the wool you gotta shear the sheep. You've got to wash it. You've got to cart it. You've got to spin it. Spin it. Then you've got to weave it. Yeah. So yes, you've got a bunch of yarn, but what am I going to do with it? I can't wear it that way. Cotton still had to be grown. With the wool, you had predators, like the wolves, so you had to you know, that you might eat the sheep. That might eat the sheep, yes. With cotton, it also um, depleted the soil if you plant right. in the same area all the time. Right. And then you had to have someone pick it. Then you had, we send it over there, or did we wash, I don't know, if we washed it, and send it first. Probably not. They'd have to, well, we'd have to run it. Did they gin it here? Did they gin the cotton here? Or did they send it over there and it was ginned? I think it was ginned over there. Yeah. It was just raw bales of cotton. Raw bales of cotton shipped to England. Right. So then they would have had to wash it and they would have had to go through the whole yeah, process the whole of thing, spinning yeah. it. Okay. Um, with the linen. The linen is very labor intensive too. That's flax, right? Made from Correct. flax? It's made from flax. You have to have the flax seed. Um, it's made from the flax. You grow it. Once it's grown, then you have to pick the seeds off so you have it for the next year. Then you have to let it dry. Then once it's dried, then you have to put it in a stream or wet it so that the outer covering of the flax breaks off. And you can get to the fibers on the inside. Then you have to you have to 
whenever it breaks off, then you have to beat it or scuttle it to break that apart. Then once you get those fibers out, then you still have to go through the same process of spinning and weaving. Mm -hmm. And the, um, lint, or the flax grew better in a boggy, loamy soil, too. So it's not like something we could just go out and... and you can't grow it anywhere. No, you can't grow it anywhere. You have to rotate your crops for that, too. Yeah. And it, it's weather, very weather-dependent. Or, yes, the cotton. Very weather dependent. Yeah. So, kind of stuck with what you have. So, what, what, what was the, would you say in the early clothing, the period that you're talking about, what, what was there, a, what was the percentage of wool to cotton clothing? Which was more it was common? Probably more linen. Or more linen more than linen. either of the other two. Linen and then wool. Because of it being imported from England, nowadays the linen is more expensive. It's anywhere from nine, twelve, sixteen dollars a yard, as opposed to the cotton. Cotton prices are going up in the 21st century, but still, it, it's not as high as the linen is. But with the linen and the wool, they could also make a thing that was called Lindsay Woolsey. Linen is very breathable. So is the wool. The wool keeps you warm in the winter and cool in the summer because then it helps the evaporate yeah. and then it cools you off. Yeah. Hmm. So linen was the was the main fabric. It was the most economical it was fabric. The most, all of the fabric was most economical depending upon where we got it from. We got, um, there was a fabric that was called denim or our modern day denim which came from Nimes, France. Calico, which you think of today as a print, came from Calcutta, India. So uh, we were, the countries were importing and exporting right and left, different things. The different colors, um, different dyes here. You could use the walnut, and they always think, oh, well, back in the colonists, they all had brown. There was never any other color. Yeah, there was. There's. Um, Turmeric makes a really brilliant yellow. Yes. Osage orange, the hulls from the Osage orange make a beautiful color too. The cockney, the cockney is the name of it, is a bug. Oh, yeah. To right. get the reds. Yes. Yeah. And if you saw Sherry Robbins yesterday, she had pokeberry. Beautiful. Beautiful crumble. Purple and magenta like. Yeah. Right. She had got. Do you hold that, the, uh, that up and I'll, yeah. I'll just zoom in on it. And of um, the different stages, or different states. I mean, if we would do something like that, is she available? State nation of my neighbors. Because I'm better if somebody shows me. It's got linen and cotton in it. Fustian, F-U-S-T-I-A-N. F-U-S-T-I-A-N. Are some of these found these days? Yes, yes. This is linen. That's a linen. The black is a linen. What, what happens? Um, this is an Onisberg. Came from Onisberg, Germany. I mean, I just love that fabric. It's, it's, it's soft, it's nice to work with. Yeah. Making something so creative out of it. You're like, how on earth did you just do that? And then further back here, this would be a fancy outfit. And they all still started with the basic garment, with the shift, and George with his shirt. Let me turn the next page. And this is the middle class. And differences are? Differences are your occupation. Um, politician, governor, something like this, lawyer. Paul's more the middle, middle in class with um, surveying. Seamstress would be in this category. This category is more farmer. Someone that's living off the land. Huh. And they have just a, a short gown. He has just a, of course, he has his waistcoat, but you also see he has a jacket there. Almost looks like. He has, uh, he has trousers on. Almost, the, the man's look is almost like uh, Asian. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Black right there. Okay. That's right there. Yeah, he has the fly front pictures there. Mm -hmm.